So this is OH5, the first Paranthropus boise to be found. It's probably dated to around 1.8 million years uh, ago. And just by looking at it initially, she named it the Nutcracker Man. So already we're thinking about diet just from this skull being found. There's already some assumptions or connections with diet. Um, so I'm going to go through these in more detail. but. Um, here are some features of Boise um, that are quite distinctive. So we've got a nice robust mandible, it's quite a long ramus, uh, this bit here, uh, quite bulky. Got really wide zygomatic arches, so these um, cheeks, cheekbones here. Got a pronounced sagittal crest, uh, which is sort of on top of the skull, we'll go through that. Really large premolars. Um, so before molars, they're getting sort of similar size to the actual molars. So that's called megadontia. And then looking at teeth a bit more, they've got really thick enamel. Uh, so I'll go through these in turn, uh, think about Boise. Um, so as I said, it's got a really robust masticatory apparatus. Um, 
you can see how big the chin is, how big the jaw is, the mandible. Um, so it's got a really tall ramus, so this bit of um, the mandible, this lower bit, uh, um, back bit, sorry. Um, so it's not only robust, but it's sort of uh, vertically ascending, sort of bringing some muscles that are used for chewing back uh, to the posterior teeth, um, so molars. Um, and then it's got a really robust corpus, so the corpus is this bit. Um, it's got a reduced wishbone effect, so if it was to be feeding on seeds, for example, to mechanically challenging food, if it's going to be loading on just one side of the mouth, it's going to create some imbalance and quite a lot of stress and strain. So to be robust, it's sort of um, working against that massive strain just on one side of the mouth. Um, so it's really robust in that way. Got a really nice finite element analysis here. Really nice study. So comparing um, simulator strain of the chimpanzee and then Boise. So it's a bit like a heat map. You can see that um, the male chimpanzee has got a lot of um, experience and a lot of stress and strain on these bits. So I guess the more the zygotic arches here, it's more red. And then this is less so. So it's sort of built to counteract that um, hard diet. Now I've mentioned a few times about zygomatic arches. Um, these bits here, the sort of cheekbones, um, those are the zygomatic arches. And that is where the temporalis muscle, um, in humans it's sort of originating here. And then going through those arches and connecting to part of the mandible. Um, so I guess most fossil hominins, you're never really going to see muscle preserved. Um, so we can make some inferences um, about those, um, how wide those arches are. And that can be indicative of the size of the muscle. So you can already see that um, Robustus and Boise have got really wide arches. If if you take this nice um, sort of look down view of it, uh, you can see how wide they are. And then early human, uh, sorry, Homo sapien, it's a bit narrower. You can still see those um, gaps though, that arch. And then if we look at it in this perspective with uh, modern humans, you can't see those at all. We obviously still have them, but they're so narrow that you can't see them in that perspective. Um, so you could say that Boise has, would have had really thick muscles uh, that are taking up that big wide space. So it's sort of relating to bite force. If you've got these really big muscles for chewing, um, you're going to have maybe a greater bite force and then less so in us. And then we've got the sagittal crest. So it's going in the sagittal direction this way. Um, it's going over the top of the skull. It's probably most pronounced in gorillas, so male gorillas have really uh, distinctive sagittal crests. And here, this is where the temporalis muscle is attaching or originating and then attaching to, I guess, the um, man uh, mandible here. And that's the same with the robust osteopath. They've got that uh, sagittal crest and um, they're bringing the muscles as well. You can see there's a slight difference in direction. They're more straight down, maybe towards these posterior teeth, uh, and that's sort of going towards anteriorly. Um, but it's a greater lever arm for those muscles, a greater distance of working is creating a bigger bite force as well. Um, so we've looked at sort of the cranium. If we look specifically at teeth, um, they've got really big premolars. So we've got Boise at the bottom and then an early homogenous species at the top. And you can just see by comparing them that Boise has bigger um, premolars. 
And then we've got a nice graph here uh, that's comparing, sorry, um, on the x-axis we've got the molar area and then we've got bite force on the y. Uh, it's sort of a correlation, we've got all different um, fossil hominins that have plotted. And then if we remember it's OH5 that Mary Leakey found and that's right at the top. So they've got a really big crown area and then uh, it's relating to a big bite force. So they think that bigger area is sort of spreading that load um, on that bigger surface area. Uh, so the, the stress is sort of spread it around. And then if you look at it even further, um, you can do analysis like this. Uh, take a slice out of this um, sort of digital model and you can see the enamels in yellow, the dentine, or the rest of it is in purple. Um, so if we compare it to a gorilla again, gorillas have really thin enamel, Boise has really thick. Um, so it's to do with sort of longevity as well as um, if a fracture were to occur from um, biting down on maybe hard seed, if the crack were to occur on the enamel dentine junction, which is just the uh, division between those two bits of the tooth, that crack is sort of less likely to reach the surface because there's a bigger area to travel through. Um, so we've looked at some of the anatomical features, uh, but in sort of recent years, there's been a few more techniques that they've used to study Boise's diet. So there could be something more to the Nutcracker Man's diet. Um, so a great way to look at teeth in more detail is doing microware analysis. So they're using SEM, so a really powerful microscope, to look at the texture of um, teeth, sort of the topography of that, um, that area. So if you're feeding on really hard uh, seeds, really hard food, you're more likely to get more like pitting, um, like dints in the teeth. Whereas if you're shearing um, on tough leaves um, and yeah, plants, it's going to be more striated, so stripy. Um, so they've done this for Boise and we can see what they might have found. Um, so interestingly, they found more striations linking to a more plant-based diet. Um, it's cousin Robustus is showing that pitting, so it's probably feeding on seeds as well. Um, so there's sort of already more to the story than just feeding on seeds. Uh, but important to note, um, with microware, um, it's more likely to just, what you're seeing, the pattern you're seeing, is probably just the last thing it ate before it died. So it's not representative at all of its lifetime diet. Um, so that is a limitation of microware. Um, it could be that Boise on its last day just decided to eat some leaves. But uh, if we just assume, yeah, it was feeding on leaves uh, throughout its lifetime, we can go even further and do stable isotope analysis um, to see what kind of vegetation it was feeding on. So we know it's plants, but what kind of plants? Uh, so there's a few photosynthetic pathways that exist in nature. So we've got C3 plants. Um, that's sort of the pathway you learn in school. Um, they're like uh, trees and shrubs. Whereas C4 has evolved a bit later than C3. Uh, but it's sort of more arid conditions. So grassland. Um, they're able to photosynthesize a little bit differently. Um, to preserve, uh, conserve water better. But a long story short, um, C3 plants have less carbon-13, so that isotope of carbon. T4 has more. Um, so we can look at Boise's teeth and do this analysis on it. And they've done that. And they've found more um, carbon-13 in Boise um, compared to some other um, hominins. So we can think about they were maybe in a more grassy environment eating more um, C4 plants. 
Um, so it could be feeding on seeds, it could be feeding on grass. Um, I think look, just looking at Boise um, as it is, the, the sort of structural form of it, the morphology, um, it looks like an anatomical specialist. That's what Mary Leakey probably assumed, thinking probably purely just ate nuts. But we've seen um, sort of a different story. So anatomical anatomical specialists might not necessarily mean you're a dietary specialist. So that's linking to this paradox in nature, Liam's paradox. Because there is some kind of overlap between um, the features of feeding on grass and the features of feeding on seeds. Uh, if you're feeding on lots of grass, you're, you're going to need a large uh, temporalis muscle. It reduces uh, fatigue when you're just continuously feeding on plants. Um, so that's sort of a link. And then again, thick enamel, it's great for feeding on um, grass as well. It sort of preserves the tooth again for that continuous action, um, longevity basically. And we've seen all those features for feeding on seeds as well. Um, so it could be that Boise um, was feeding on grass um, the majority of the time. It's an abundant resource. But when, sort of maybe in winter, when those resources weren't there, it was able to use uh, this really distinctive morphology to exploit uh, the niche of nuts and seeds that are there in these sort of hostile conditions. Um, so that's sort of to do with fallback foods. Um, the fallback food being, in this case, seeds and nuts. Um, so it's, it's ready for that um, hostile period of time. Uh, so full that foods here are sort of dictating this robust anatomy. Um, so I've quickly gone through Boise's diet, but I'm going to just go through my master's project, which was linking to Boise, but looking at particular primate and their uh, mechanically challenging diet. Um, so I was looking at particular monkey, as I said, uh, the sooty mangabe. It lives in the Ivory Coast. Um, and what's important about this um, monkey is that it feeds on seeds all year round. Uh, so it's dependent on it. It's um, a habit of theirs to feed on seeds all year round. Um, so it's got similar morphology to Boise, thick enamel, large premolars, robust mandible, and it needs a large gape as well. You can see it feeding on a seed there. Um, but again, that's something significant about um, the city mangabe is that they've measured its um, masticatory muscles and found that um, it has a really low predicted bite force. So it's got a low um, cross-sectional area of the muscles, a low leverage of those muscles, and then if or thought, it must have a low bite force. So they've sort of thought, how is it feeding on these seeds all the time when it can't generate the bite force to do so? So I had to sort of think about this question, how are they exploiting this niche without the bite force? So I sort of took a step back and thought about um, its behaviour, what have they observed in these monkeys? And then even the seed morphology itself. Um, so with most seeds and nuts, they have an endocarp, this shell, and there's sort of a line of weakness uh, where it sort of cracks open eventually, uh, called the sulcus. So I thought about um, this fact of seeds and thought about its behaviour. Is it orientating seeds in a specific way to get around uh, generating big bite forces? So in the University of York, I used this compression testing machine. Um, my supervisor created these um, sort of 3D printed perfect replicas of the sooty mangabe's um, upper and lower jaw and covered it in bronze. So I stuck these uh, pieces to the 
upper and lower bits of the compression testing machine. And I basically, um, I focused on the premolar and did sort of compressions of all these different uh, seeds. So actually I had three different types of seeds, but I had lots of them. And I was um, testing it on the sulcus, so orientated on that sulcus line. So you can see this one's on the sulcus. And then I was doing the um, sort of perpendicular non-sulcus. And I was testing force and energy for that to then fracture. Um, so it's sort of fairly obvious what I found because if we think about it, it's a line of weakness. Um, orientating on the sulcus, you don't need to generate big force or energy. So there's low force and energy to crack that nut, basically. So it sort of reiterated that behavioural investigation really does matter. Um, with the sooty mangabe, it may have found a way to not have to um, generate really big bite force, which is energetically costly anyway and um, it's able to exploit a niche which is energetically rich, I guess. Seeds and nuts uh, are more energetically enriching than grasses. Uh, if it's not always equal function. It does have the sort of morphology to do it, but the bite force isn't equivalent. Um, so, yeah, robust morphology doesn't always equal bite force. If they were to just find a crania of the city mangabe. They can guess, yeah, it's probably feeding on seeds, but there's more to it in that it hasn't got a big bite force. Um, so I've sort of linked it back to Boise. Unfortunately, we can't observe Boise in the wild. Um, so there may be more to it. We need to think about behavioural adaptations as well. Um, but it's great to have sort of microware stabilised tip analysis um, and recently dental chipping in Boise. Um, so yeah, to say you don't necessarily have to take the anatomical features at face value and conclude a diet, it might not be representative of the actual um, uh, yeah, context. Uh, so that sort of concludes my talk. I've got my image references and my paper references as well. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. Uh, so are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, I do have one.